Good morning from Seabase, the space station beyond uh, or under Berlin. Uh, welcomes you to day two of the RC3 streaming. We are starting in a few seconds with uh, catching the NSO group's Pegasus spyware. This is something that has caught attention among the security and hacker communities over the world in the last, I would guess, two years or so. There had been some spectacular cases of murder, kidnappings, uh, journalists being threatened, other things. Um, the infamous uh, software doing this is called Pegasus. It's marketed by a company called, by, uh, known by the three-letter acronym NSO, whatever this stands for. Um, and actually, Amnesty International and its IT department, so to say, uh, has invested quite some effort into detecting uh, whether an, a device has been infected by Pegasus or not. NSO marketed this, uh, among other things, as so-called undetectable. Well, undetectable as in software on a device, as we see. And uh, our speaker today, Donica, Donica O'Carl from Ireland and from Amnesty International, will be presenting uh, how they developed detection tools for this nasty piece of spyware that had, has become so popular among secret um, secret actors, state actors, and, and others around the world. Okay, enough for the introduction. Donica, the scene and the stream is yours. Good morning. Um, good morning, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, so as the intro said, um, today I'd like to talk to you about um, NSO Group's Pegasus spyware. I'm pretty sure I'd like to explain a little bit about how we at Amnesty has been investigated Pegasus over the past few years. And I'll also uh, explain and demonstrate some of the tools we have developed and published to let others also um, investigate and detect uh, Pegasus spyware potentially on their devices or on the devices of other people in civil society. Uh, so my name is Dirk Carroll, and I'm a technologist based at the Amnesty International Security Lab in Berlin. Uh, we've got a small team uh, who focuses on investigating uh, targeted digital threats, such as spyware, uh, phishing, and other kinds of surveillance that's directed against uh, civil society and human rights defenders around the world. So as the intro said, um, Pegasus has got a lot of attention in the past, uh, in the past few months. So you may have seen this uh, Pegasus project revelations that were published uh, in, in July during the summer. So the Pegasus project was a, a global investigation into abuses linked to NX Go Group's Pegasus uh, spyware. This investigation was based on a leaked, um, a leaked data set of uh, 50,000 potential Pegasus targets, uh, which Amnesty International and Forbidden Stories had access to. And so this global media investigation was coordinated by Forbidden Stories with the participation of about 80 journalists uh, from 17 different uh, media organizations around the world. Uh, during the Pegasus project, Amnesty International uh, was the, took out the role of a technical partner, and the focus for Amnesty International was to perform a detailed, innovative forensic analysis on the devices of potential targets. Uh, and through this kind of forensic analysis and this technical work, uh, we were able to identify traces of Pegasus, uh, either targeting or infecting, infecting targeted, targeting or infection, uh, on my devices. So over the multi month project, uh, Amnesty Security Lab analyzed about 67 devices. And from these 67 devices of potential targets, um, at least 37 showed clear traces of Pegasus targeting or infection. So this is really quite a, quite a high number of infected devices. And these devices included uh, journalists, activists, uh, opposition political figures, uh, all kinds of people who are being unlawfully surveilled using Pegasus. Uh, overall, of the phones we have checked, which were iPhones and which hadn't been replaced, you know, which still contained data of the targeting, uh, more than 80% of the phones um, that were on of this list of potential targets showed traces of Pegasus. So, um, yeah, in July, uh, these stories came out. Uh, they highlighted cases of, of civil society being targeted, such as journalists in, in Hungary, activists in Morocco, uh, activists, um, Saudi Arabian dissidents, uh, also family members of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, which the investigation showed had been uh, targeted with Pegasus spyware both before and after his, his brutal murder. 
Um, so yeah, you can you can go and read many of these stories online. Uh, today, I'd like to focus on again how we get how we got there, how we developed these these tools, how we developed this methodology for for finding Pegasus, uh, and also explain about how you can also go and do uh, this kind of searching for for Pegasus and for other uh, mobile spyware. So let's uh, take a step back for a second and ask: So, what exactly is Pegasus? This name is well known, but what exactly is the software and how does how does it work? So, a first thing to remember is that actually, while Pegasus has been got more well known in the last two years, it's not actually a new a new tool or a new product. So we know Pegasus has been around and been developed by NSO Group uh, since at least uh, 2010. On, on the left hand side here of the diagram, you can see uh, a Pegasus brochure from 2010, where it describes how Pegasus can be uh, installed um, on BlackBerry devices. And we believe the original version of Pegasus was focused on BlackBerry, uh, because back in 2010, um, smartphones were less prevalent than they are now. And so BlackBerry is kind of a key target for some of the this uh, security agencies who may want to buy this kind of spyware. So it developed over time. Um, here on the, on the right hand side, we can see some diagrams that were from a leaked Pegasus brochure that was published in 2014. Um, in the first diagram here, it talks about how uh, Pegasus is installed on a phone. In this example, it's showing how um, a Pegasus um, kind of infection link can be sent over SMS to the target device. And then if opened, how the data that can be collected and passed back to the, the operator of the Pegasus software. So that's just uh, one example of, of from, from their own diagrams. Um, here in the circle below, you'll see a little bit of what Pegasus claims to be able to monitor. And uh, if you look at it, you can see it's, it's basically everything on the device. So it's talking about collecting email addresses, collecting SMS messages, tracking location data, even reading the calendar, um, turning on the microphone of the phone. And so bear in mind, while this, this diagram is quite old, it's like six or seven years old, you get an idea of what kind of data the Pegasus software will try to collect from the phone. It's basically, it can access every kind of uh, data on the phone that might be of, of interest to somebody who's carrying out this surveillance. Um, one important thing to remember is that um, the Pegasus spyware is able to get uh, very kind of deep access to the phone. So it's fundamentally able to access everything on the phone that the user is able to access and more. So even if you're using a, a messaging app such as Signal or Telegram, which may be encrypted, uh, the Pegasus software is able to access that data and those messages before they are encrypted on the device. So even uh, once there's spyware running on the phone itself, none of these encrypted messaging apps will help because it has such low level access to the device. So that's a little bit about what exactly Pegasus tries to collect and what it, uh, yeah, what it, what people can do with with using the Pegasus software. So where exactly did um, the investigations into Pegasus start? So if we go back uh, as far as 2016, um, it was when Pegasus was first kind of identified in the wild being being used to target uh, an activist. So in this case, in 2016, um, Pegasus was first found by Citizen Lab. Uh, and Citizen Lab is a group of researchers uh, based in the University of Toronto in Canada, who, who also works on investigating uh, spyware targeting civil society. Uh, so in this case, um, a UE-based uh, human rights defender named Admin Ansur uh, began to receive suspicious messages over SMS. So you can see some screenshots of the messages on the right. Um, so Ahmed Masur was his cautious about these because in the past he had previously been targeted with other kinds of spyware tools, including including Finn Fisher. So when he began to see, receive these messages, he he was cautious about them and he shared them with Citizen Lab, uh, who then began to investigate them. So what Citizen Lab realized is that um, these looked to be an attack message, uh, and they opened these attack links on their own testing phone. Uh, when they did this, they were able to capture. Um, the exploit that was being uh, delivered over these, these links and also able to capture a copy of the Pegasus payload. So what happens when these links are opened is that the link is open in a, in a web browser such as Safari. Uh, when the link is opened, uh, the Pegasus server would return some JavaScript, some code that would exploit um, an unknown flaw in the Safari web browser. And by kind of manipulating the Safari web browser and exploiting this unknown flow, they could then get their own code to start running inside this very web browser. And eventually with the help of some additional uh, flaws, they could then get more privileged access on the iPhone and eventually install 
the full uh, Pegasus payload. So yeah, Citizen Lab first found it in 2016. It was it was a very important discovery, and it showed just how how serious some of the threats uh, facing um, civil society were. That there were people willing to use these kinds of very expensive exploits to start targeting uh, human rights offenders who were just doing their human rights work. Uh, fortunately, after this, Amin Mansur continued to get harassed, and he was sentenced to prison, and he's currently still in prison uh, from for, since 2017, so for about uh, four years now. So where did we at Amnesty start investigating this? So our team has been investigating these kinds of threats for a while, uh, but really we started focusing on, on NSO and investigating NSO uh, in 2018, um, after an Amnesty colleague of ours started to receive some suspicious messages. So this, uh, this colleague uh, in May 2018 received this message, you can see here on the left. Uh, the message is written in Arabic, but it um, basically claims that there is going to be a protest uh, happening shortly outside the Saudi Arabian embassy. Uh, and they asked the Amnesty staff member to, to support the, the protest and then to click on this link for, for more information. So fortunately, our Amnesty colleague, when they received this message, they got quite suspicious. They were like, this is, this is weird, I don't know this person. And so they shared a screenshot of this message with uh, us at the Amnesty Security Lab and we began to investigate. So quite quickly, when we started looking at this uh, domain name and the server, um, we, we agreed to look kind of suspicious. Um, we also managed to identify some additional domains uh, and servers that were related to this original Akbar Arabia domain. Uh, and quite quickly, it started to appear to us that um, this was indeed something suspicious and maybe it was some kind of attack message. So at the time, we didn't know it was necessarily an SO group. Um, by, by looking at the original initial servers here, we managed to create kind of a fingerprint. So some way of identifying the particular configuration of the domain name and the server uh, sent inside of this message. Uh, with the aid of this fingerprint, we then began to do what's called an internet scan. So we connected to every single server in the internet, uh, send a particular request, and then find any other server in the internet that matched this particular fingerprint, this particular configuration from the server. So by doing this uh, internet scanning, uh, what we found was 600 uh, different domains all across the internet uh, that matched this fingerprint and that appeared to be related to the same kinds of attacks. So what was really what was really key is that we found that uh, these these um, domains were actually related to Pegasus because NSO Group had made one kind of key mistake or key flaw when they were setting up this infrastructure. So what happened is, um, as, as described earlier, Citizen Lab had previously identified uh, servers being used by NSO Group in 2016. After they were exposed in 2016, NSO shut down all of these domains and infrastructure and then began to set up new kind of infrastructure that would be not uh, related to NSO or not linkable to NSO. Unfortunately, they made a mistake because they had reused uh, one domain name from the previous set of infrastructure uh, and also being used this new set of infrastructure. So uh, by finding this one domain out of 600 that had previously been, been uh, used by NSO, we were able to show that these 600 domains were also related to Pegasus. And so we were able to show that this uh, message that was sent to our Amnesty International colleague uh, was indeed uh, related to Pegasus and it was an attempt to, to compromise their device. So we published this, these, our findings in uh, August uh, 2018. Um, at the time, we also identified that another Saudi Arabian activist had similarly been targeted with a Pegasus exploit message uh, over WhatsApp. Uh, following this, Amnesty International also supported a legal action in Israel, which asked the Israeli Ministry of Defense to revoke uh, NSO's export licenses to prevent this Pegasus software being sold to countries that would uh, abuse it to target Amnesty and also target other um, human rights activists. Uh, unfortunately, later the Israeli court um, rejected the, the legal complaint um, and said that the Israeli Ministry of Defense had adequate safeguards in place to prevent um, NSO's exports um, being sold to countries who would abuse it. Um, here, on, here on the bottom on the left, you can see that um, uh, you can see a, a chart which shows the number of uh, Pegasus servers um, online at the time. And we can see here that when we published this report, NSO acted quite quickly to shut down all 500 or 600 servers that were being used to deliver Pegasus. Uh, so this just shows that you know NSO is kind of reading this research, is paying attention to what it is, trying to uh, avoid getting their infrastructure and servers uh, discovered by, by researchers who are investigating these kinds of abuses.
So this was back in uh, in 2018. So um, after this, after discovering this attack against the Amnesty staff member, uh, with Amnesty continue trying to investigate uh, Pegasus, continue trying to find more cases of abuse. Uh, and we next found um, uh, Pegasus targeting happening in, in Morocco in, in 2019. So you can see here on the right, um, this time we found that a, a Moroccan uh, human rights offender named Mati Manjib uh, was being targeted repeatedly with Pegasus. When we checked his phone, uh, we found that he had some uh, suspicious messages. Um, they're saying that the messages claim that there is some uh, some scandal or there's some news story, and they're asking uh, the target to to click on these links to find out more information. So when we looked at these these links, we knew immediately that they were Pegasus links uh, because we had previously identified uh, these domains as uh, one of the 600 domains that had were being used in 2018. So for example, you can see the in the second message here on the right, we see the domain videos download.co. We knew this was Pegasus because we had previously identified uh, and, and published this domain uh, in 2018. So this time we knew uh, Matthew was being in with Pegasus, uh, but we, we realized we needed to do some more investigation to see if his phone was indeed compromised or if we could collect uh, more information from his device. So when we did this, we actually found um, something quite interesting on Matthew's phone because we found what we believed was evidence of a new type of, uh, of targeting on his phone. Instead of um, relying on the target kind of being tricked into clicking on a link, which is maybe not reliable, or maybe the target can can see something suspicious, we instead saw them uh, using an, what's called a network injection attack. So how a network injection attack works is like this. So a network injection involves um, having some kind of equipment or software running on the, uh, with access to the internet connection of the, the mobile device. So this can either be at the mobile phone network or potentially having some, some software or hardware running on the same Wi-Fi network as the target. Uh, and what it does is when the target is, is browsing the web on their phone, uh, eventually the target um, browses and clicks on a link that goes to a regular HTTP website, so without HTTPS. And so when this regular HTTP request is made, uh, the software that's running on the upstream network can see this HTTP request. Uh, and when the HTTP request happens, it can instead, instead of returning the correct response or the correct content, instead returns a, a HTTP redirect. Uh, and the HTTP redirect will then send the browser of the phone to a malicious uh, exploit site, where, which can then hack the phone. So in the case of Mati, we found that he had tried to go and check his email. He typed in yahoo.f4 on his browser. When he typed in yahoo.f4, uh, the software running on the on the upstream network um, saw this uh, clear text connection and then redirected his phone to this exploit link we see above. So you, you see the domain is quite suspicious. Get it now, the free 247 downloadscom uh, And again, it has um, some random characters at the end which looks like a kind of ex export link. So at the time we suspected this was, was Pegasus uh, and it was a new way of, of delivering Pegasus without tricking the user and clicking on a link. Um, but we weren't certain that it, it was Pegasus, potentially with some other kinds of, um, uh, of spyware. Fortunately for us, um, NSO helped uh, to confirm that this really was Pegasus because before we published this report, um, Amnesty wrote to NSO group sharing our findings uh, and interestingly, one day after we shared the findings with NSO, this um, spyware server got shut down and went offline. And this was al already a week before the report was made publicly available. So that kind of confirmed to us that NSO really was controlling this infrastructure and we were able to get it shut down even when we'd only privately shared this information with, with NSO. Uh, a bit later, we found some more uh, information about how this attack may have been done. Um, NSO um, at a trade fair was demonstrating some new type of hardware they had developed, which you can see here on the photo on the right. And we believe this, this photo is of um, some kind of uh, MZ catcher or fake base station, um, which can run a, a fake mobile phone network. Uh, and then a uh, target's phone, such as Matthew, could connect to this uh, fake mobile phone base station. And from that position, it could be possible for an NSO to redirect the phone to a malicious, uh, uh, a malicious exploit link. So we're not sure what happened, what happened in this case, if it was the advice that this was used, but we, we believe that NSO is, is demonstrating or testing these kinds of what are called tactical infection methods. So this is, this is where our findings were in Morocco. We started to realize that actually, 
relying on checking for SMS messages, checking for links, or relying on people coming to us um, with something suspicious wasn't going to work anymore because we began to see what were called the zero click attacks. And so all the zero click attack is, is any way of infecting a device that doesn't rely on some interaction from the user, doesn't rely on the user clicking on a link. So we can see here some examples of other um, zero click attacks that have been discovered over the past couple of years. I guess one of the first ones here was in 2019, where uh, NSO Group uh, developed an exploit for, for WhatsApp, and it was then used by their, their customers to target at least uh, 1,400 uh, different people around the world. Um, and all of this, how this worked was that the, the, the target would simply need to uh, receive a call over WhatsApp, even a missed call, uh, and the exploit would be able to kind of compromise their phone without the user clicking anything. As I, as I described earlier, we saw these kinds of network rejection attacks happen. And then later in 2020, Sins Lab also found um, an, I, an iMessage zero day being used uh, to again compromise uh, iPhone users without any interaction in, in 2020. So from our own investigations, we have found that Enzo has been using uh, various uh, zero click exploits since at least summer 2017 until uh, July of this year. Um, so we know it's not something that's quite new for NSO, but at least it's something we've started uh, only recently discovering in the past few years. And we've seen yeah, NSO putting a lot of focus into developing these kinds of complicated, but very powerful uh, zero click exploits. So now that we know that NSO is, is, is uh, and their customers are using these kind of zero click attacks, we realized we needed to do something kind of more advanced to try and uh, find these cases, uh, cases of, of surveillance. Um, the big problem with mobile devices is a lack of visibility. Whereas on, on desktop or laptop computers, we have antivirus available or we have EDR systems available. There's really nothing similar that was available for mobile devices. So these kinds of attacks, especially zero click attacks, uh, are often going undetected. Um, when we began to investigate this, we realized that it was difficult to perform forensics on mobile devices. Uh, it's actually not impossible. And we were somewhat surprised to realize that iPhones actually allow a significant amount of relevant data to be extracted from the phones themselves uh, in the form of an iPhone backup. And so it's actually quite um, quite possible to start doing a forensic analysis on iPhones. Uh, unfortunately, with Android devices, we found we're much more limited. Um, because of restrictions on the Android operating system, it is impossible to extract much data in an Android backup. And so all we've really been able to do on Android is to simply check the SMS messages and maybe the browser history for some traces of, of targeting. But again, it's just it's just much less data is available on Androids compared to iPhones. Uh, the other big problem we realize is that there's there's a lack of any kinds of public tools for consensual mobile forensics. All of the forensic tools that are out there are designed for, for people to uh, extract data from phones that they don't own, whether phones that have been seized or phones that have been somehow otherwise obtained. There's no, there's no tools available to really check your own phone for signs of, of spyware. So this is where the mobile verification toolkit comes into play. So uh, MVT uh, is a public tool developed by Amnesty International that's designed to simplify the process of analyzing mobile devices for traces of spyware. Um, here it's available on GitHub, you can go check it out. Uh, and just to highlight all of the, all of the cases of Pegasus targeting that I've described previously and all of the cases and traces that I'll, just, I'll present for the rest of the presentation, all of these have been found using MVT. So MVT really works to um, detect advanced uh, spyware, including spyware using uh, zero click, zero day exploits, uh, and really sophisticated stuff um, such as Pegasus. So while all of these um, different spyware vendors try to say how to think it's undetectable, uh, it is definitely advanced. They definitely spend a lot of money in developing this stuff, but it's not magic. And if you're uh, careful and diligent about checking for traces, there's always uh, mistakes that are made. There's always ways of, of identifying uh, potential suspicious behavior on these devices. Um, so MVT is, is written in Python. It's uh, very easy to install. If you have pip, you can just go pip tree and install MVT. Uh, and here's how it's, how it's used. Again, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, to check an iPhone, you simply make a backup of the iPhone and you run this one command. So it'll be MVT iOS, check backup, uh, and then you provide the backup uh, folder. Um, in the command here, we also see what's called a sticks file. So a sticks file is simply a file containing um, indicators, 
um, this may be like domain names or IP addresses or process names that are known to be linked to uh, a spyware tool. And so MVT is a generic tool. It can be used with um, Pegasus indicators, but also can be used with indicators for other spyware tools and can be used to detect other spyware. So MVT is, is a modular framework. Uh, it has modules for parsing different kinds of databases, such as SMS messages or browser history or other kinds of files in the device. Um, I'm going to go through and explain a few of the modules that are available in MVT and show how this can be used to, to find traces of Pegasus or other similar uh, spyware tools. So one module that is, is quite useful um, is the SMS module, which is quite straightforward. It simply reads the SMS database in iPhone backup. It will extract all of the links from those SMS messages and check if any of those SMS messages contain links to uh, known uh, malicious domains. So in this case, we're checking a backup that has been targeted with, with Pegasus. And we see that we see that there's multiple domains that are found that are related to Pegasus. We see this from revolutionnews.com, the co, stop sms.biz. Um, from what we know about NSO, we've seen these kinds of exploit SMS messages used primarily uh, between 2016 and 2018. Um, but we've also seen uh, Pegasus links as far back as 2014 and as recently as 2020. So this has been quite common and I and if zero click attacks are not available, I think we'll still see um, these kinds of uh, exploit links being sent in SMS. So another data source that's quite useful and quite helpful for finding traces of, of targeting is uh, the S Safari uh, browser history. Um, so what we've seen is we've seen, uh, sometimes we identified traces of exploit uh, being uh, recorded in the Safari browser history, especially after a uh, network injection attack. So in this case, while there's no link in SMS, when the network injection ha attack happens, the exploit server uh, domain will be recorded in the browser history. And so by checking the browser history, we may be able to find uh, evidence that this attack had happened. So on the, on the right here, here, you can see a screenshot. Uh, and this screenshot was actually taken um, by a Moroccan uh, journalist, uh, Omar Radi, when he was being targeted with uh, one of these network rejection attacks in Morocco. So when he uh, yeah, was browsing the web, he clicked the link, and then it silently redirected him to this web page. And when this screenshot was taken, it was actually running the JavaScript trying to exploit his phone. So unfortunately, uh, following the publication of this research, uh, Omar Radi was uh, repeatedly harassed by the Moroccan authorities, and then he was uh, eventually uh, jailed after an unfair trial, and he's currently currently in jail. So another another file that was quite useful um, in our investigations is something called the ID status cache file. So uh, the ID status cache file is a file on iPhones, and it can tra contains traces of any iCloud accounts uh, which interacted with a device. Um, this can be interacting with a device over a bunch of different uh, Apple services, including iMessage, AirDrop, Apple Photos. Um, and so what was really useful about this file is it showed us uh, which malicious accounts, which like kind of Pegasus related uh, accounts had been uh, targeting a particular device. So what we know about Pegasus, uh, we believe that uh, these malicious accounts are, are have been set up uh, and have been uh, used by one individual uh, Pegasus customer. So you can see here in the in the first row, we see this email address, Lena Keller. Um, and we saw this um, this uh, account being used to deliver iMessage zero day to quite a number of different activists. So we seen it being used to deliver um, exploits to two different, um, two different Moroccan activists uh, and a couple of French uh, political figures. So by by looking at uh, which individuals have been targeted by the same the same account or by the same customer, we're able to kind of get a better idea of who that customer might be and have some idea about the attribution for that uh, attack. Um, the same in these other in these other in cases. For example, we see the Jessica Davies uh, one three four five email. Uh, this was found on the phone of two different uh, Hungarian journalists. Uh, same for the Emma Davies address. Uh, again, for the this final address here, Williams Any. Um, we found this uh, on the phone of two different uh, uh, Hungarian Hungarian um, individuals and our Hungarian activist. So this was uh, really useful for us in our investigation because it really helped us get a better idea of who might be behind um, some of the attacks that we were we were seeing. 
So the previous logs I showed about SMS uh, data and browser history, these um, show kind of traces of targeting. They showed somebody's been sent a malicious link, but they don't necessarily prove that a phone has been successfully compromised. So what I'll show now is, is some of the logs we can use to show that a device was indeed compromised. Uh, one of these files that was uh, very useful for us in our investigations was the so-called data usage file. So uh, the data usage file on iPhone is a file that records information about how much uh, mobile data traffic each process on the phone is used. So this may be used to like help the iPhone keep track of you know which apps on your phone are using the most of your mobile data. But what was really helpful for this is that it actually recorded uh, the names of some of the Pegasus processes um, and how much data each of these Pegasus processes were using. So from what we know about NSO uh, Pegasus, we believe that when Pegasus is installed on a phone, it will kind of pick a, a random name that it uses to kind of hide itself when running on the system. Uh, through our investigation, we found about 50 different uh, process names that uh, the Pegasus process was, was using to try and hide itself. And once we'd identified these process names, then we could go and look for these Pegasus, known Pegasus process names on uh, devices of potential targets. What's helpful in this database is it also shows um, a timestamp of when this uh, process name was first kind of started on the device, when it was last seen on the device, and also it gives you some kind of information about how much data um, this process transferred. And in some cases, this has been gigabytes of data, which shows that really the, the, the Pegasus spyware is extracting a lot of data from the device. Uh, and again, this is all automated MVT. So if you check uh, a phone using MVT with the Pegasus indicators, it'll show um, quite clearly if any of these um, processes have been found on the device. Uh, another feature that's been uh, very helpful for us in, in our analysis is uh, the timeline feature of MVT. So how the timeline feature works is it takes all of the different uh, indicators and modules on the phone. So for example, it checks the SMS messages, it checks the, the file system, and every every event, like every SMS message, every bra web browser lookup will all be recorded in a single file uh, with the date that it happened. So by looking at this timeline, we can often see what different events happened uh, around the same time as each other. And this can give us some of the uh, be some idea about how attacks were actually delivered on the device. So I want to just give you just one example of, of how this timeline can be used. Uh, just so you know how to use this timeline in, in your own investigations. So this is actually um, a demonstration of a phone um, of a Rwandan activist who was uh, targeted in June uh, 2021 using uh, the forced entry iMessage uh, zero day. So we can see here on the timeline that on at 8 p.m. 8.45, uh, we see the phone began to receive some push notifications over iMessage. So it seems it receives like 46 push notifications and then what we saw was that um, SMS attachments began to be written to the, the phone. So in the final line here, we see that a file is written, in the, written to the SMS attachments directory. And if you look at the, at the end of the line, we see that the, the file being written to disk actually had a .gif attachment. So at the time, we, we thought this was something to do with the, the exploit and somehow uh, NSO was delivering their exploit in a, in a dot, .gif file. If we look a little bit later in the timeline, we see that about 10 minutes later on the same day, uh, a Pegasus process uh, starts running on the phone, this OTP GRFD process. Uh, shortly afterwards, it's some additional files are written on disk and, and some more Pegasus processes start. So by looking at this timeline together, we can see quite clearly that the phone is going to receive iMessage messages. These GIF attachments started to be written on disk, and then about 10 minutes later, um, the phone was, was compromised with the Pegasus. So remember here, like there was no interaction from the user. They didn't click any link. Uh, as far as I'm aware, they didn't even notice anything happening on the device. It's simply silently these messages were being delivered. And after 10 or 20 minutes, um, Pegasus began to uh, gain access to the device. So we'd shared some of these findings with Apple. And then later in September 2021, uh, Apple uh, Citizen Lab uh, identified a copy of this um, exploit on another uh, phone of another activist and I shared it with Apple and Apple patched this uh, vulnerability in September 2021. So that's uh, a little bit of how MVT works and how some of this methodology works um, to identify uh, traces of Pegasus on a device. 
So since we published our, our forensic methodology and our tools, uh, many other uh, groups and organizations have been using uh, these tools and methodology to check uh, other devices for signs of Pegasus and have found quite a number of uh, new cases. Uh, here at the top right, we can see an example of uh, another NGO, Frontline Defenders, who identified uh, six Palestinian human rights defenders who had their devices hacked using Pegasus. Uh, in these other cases, we see um, that the Belgian uh, military intelligence services had used a similar methodology uh, to check the phones of journalists in, in Belgium. And they found that a, a journalist, a Belgian journalist, uh, Peter van Linden, had his uh, iPhone hacked, who they suspected by Rwanda. Uh, again, we see another case where French intelligence services uh, confirmed that a number of French journalists uh, had their phones hacked using, using Pegasus, again, using a similar uh, methodology. So what I'd like to highlight is like MVT can really uh, be useful in, in identifying traces of Pegasus, but also MVT is designed as a kind of a generic mobile forensic tool. Um, so when used with Pegasus indicators, it'll find Pegasus, but it also can be used to go and proactively search for new kinds of spyware. Uh, so I'd really recommend that if you're suspicious that phones may be targeted with this kind of spyware, you can use MVT to extract some data and then dig into it. Um, if the person is a, member of civil society or an activist, then Amnesty and other organizations will be happy to help uh, support uh, some of these investigations. Uh, also, MVT is an open source tool. Um, it's based on different modules. And so we're always open to ideas for, for new modules and new detection ideas to help uh, make this tool better and better able to detect uh, new kinds of threats. One thing to remember about uh, uh, MVT is it's um, it's designed to detect a certain kind of spyware. Unfortunately, the people who develop these spyware, they're, they're smart people and they read these reports and they watch these kinds of presentations. And so every time uh, we publish some information about how to detect uh, these kinds of spyware targeting civil society, um, the different uh, spyware vendors and actors will try to improve their tools to avoid them being detected. We'll try to kind of upgrade their infrastructure to, to hide it again, to, to better uh, obscure their activities. So just to give an example, here's uh, some of the developments of uh, NSO's uh, own infrastructure over time. We see that after we published uh, Amnesty Publisher Report in 2018, much infrastructure was shut, was shut down. And then later, over the next uh, two years, it began to run and set up more infrastructure, um, which was again uh, shut down uh, after discovery in, in 2021. So it's a constant arms race. And so um, while, while this, these tools are useful to detect packages now, it's not always going to be just automatic, and it's important to do further research to try and identify uh, new traces and new kinds of attacks. So what, what is the future for mobile spyware? So one thing I'd like to reiterate is that while we focus a lot on NSO group and Pegasus in this, in this, in this research, in this talk, uh, and also there's been a lot of focus on NSO group, it's not the only mobile spyware out there. And there's definitely many other players who are trying to get into the space and trying to also develop similar kinds of spyware tools. Um, which are then uh, sold to to different customers. Uh, we've seen that from this investigation, we, we've found uh, at least 180 journalists who are potential targets of, of Pegasus and many other human rights activists and opposition politicians who have been targeted with these tools over the last uh, number of years. Uh, so far, um, these threat actors and these, these eight state agencies have been able to target activists and civil society with impunity. Uh, due to a lack of visibility and telemetry on mobile platforms. Um, they've simply just been getting away with it because they haven't been detected. So tools such as MVT can help uh, expose some of these threats, um, but they need to be used more widely and need to be used with more civil society to get to really understand the full scope of these kinds of threats. Um, I think it's also important that uh, industry, uh, the tech industry and security industry works closely with civil society uh, to help detect and expose these threats because unfortunately, the people most at risk um, from these kinds of really serious attacks uh, are also some of the people who are least equipped, both financially and technically, to to defend against them. Uh, so to conclude, uh, I think we're going to continue to see attackers focusing on mobile. Uh, mobile is where all the data is. No other place gives you as much insight into somebody's life, into all their most innermost thoughts. Even just having a, a, a microphone in everybody's pocket, in someone's pocket, is such a powerful. Uh, position to be in that we think um, companies and states will continue trying to develop these kinds of, of tools. 
uh, we know that I think zero click exploits are going to be highly, highly desirable. And so while uh, Apple and others have done a great job in making attacks against iMessage more difficult, um, it's almost certain that these kinds of uh, cyber surveillance companies will continue trying to develop zero click exploits. And if not for iMessage, then maybe for other chat platforms, I don't know, like Signal or Telegram or WhatsApp, they're going to try and attack um, other, other applications that um, activists are using. Um, unfortunately, it's not possible um, for activists and civil society to protect themselves from these kinds of zero day attacks from a technical sense. So we definitely need um, more continued collaboration between the civil society and key platform vendors to help identify and defend against these threats. And also we urgently need um, better regulation to prevent these kinds of really sophisticated spyware tools being sold to, to, to states and agencies, which have a long history of abusing them uh, to target uh, civil society and political opposition. So thank you all for listening. I'm happy to uh, answer some questions though. If you have some uh, questions or if you're concerned about, if you're a member of civil society or an activist and concerned about surveillance, please feel free to contact us at share at amnesty.tech. Thank you. Thank you, Donica. Uh, thank you from Seabase. Uh, we have already taken some overtime this uh, early hacker morning. Um, there have been popping up some small questions on our internal pad here from our tiny audience at Seabase. We don't have that much time left. Just uh, can you give us an indication? What is the pace of this ongoing war? Uh, do you feel that NSO Group is actively fighting MVT and your tool development? Or did, didn't you uh, get this honor yet? Um, definitely, we've seen even in the past year, uh, we saw NSO starting to be more careful about uh, cleaning up their forensic traces. Um, mm -hmm. And since you know, 2020, they've begun to already clean some of the traces that we've been using. Uh, and, and it's clear they realize that people are investigating and that there is a risk of people discovering this stuff. And I feel like after the revelations this summer, they're going to have uh, much more proactively trying to, to clean up some of these traces. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, as I said, um, NSO is one company out there. There's also many other companies trying to compete in the same space. Um, so even if NSO gets better, then you know, other companies are still out there and can still be, be caught using MVT. Um, and fundamentally, even if they, they clean up some traces um, for any kind of failed attacks, these traces are still going to be left around because it won't be possible to for the spyware to clean up the traces. Mm -hmm. So one could st still, uh, uh, after an attack, eventually, eventually on an old device, years later, discover that there had been some spy spyware activity which may be in the long run interesting information ab about uh, dark campaigns and things. So um, yeah, NSO is not the only actor, there, there will be more. Uh, do you feel that there are just copycats in the market or do you think there will be completely new uh, threats in the future? So I guess there's always uh, there's lots of smart people working with these companies who are trying to develop these tools. Um, just uh, last uh, just earlier this month, uh, Citizen Lab published a report about another um, cyber surveillance vendor called Cytrux, uh, based in, based in North, Mac North Macedonia. And they were selling similar spyware, um, which is using kind of one-click attacks using links um, to help compromise iPhones and Android phones. Um, so that's that's one company that's competing in this space. Um, there's other companies doing doing similar um, kinds of targeting. What we believe, um, you know, NSO was definitely the biggest uh, company in this space. Uh, and they had a lot of money to invest and in, especially invest in these kind of zero-click attacks. Mm. So, for now, um, we don't know of another company that's as, as big or sophisticated as NSO, but I think many others will be trying to take their place if NSO uh, becomes uh, less popular. I see. I see. Okay, thank you very much. We uh, have to go over to the C3 morning show in a few seconds. Thank you very much uh, for this interesting talk this morning. Uh, again, share at amnesty.tech is the address to go to. And this is probably one of the talks you want to watch again on media.ccc.de in a few days when this has been published. So greetings to Ireland. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, we will meet and see again uh, in real, I hope. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Have a good day. Everything is uh, licensed under a CC by 4.0, and it is all for the community. To download for everybody.